As the sun rises over the Limpopo River in Bait Bridge, the landscape resonates with life. This is one of the many landscapes that have often been identified as dry land. With sparse vegetation and erratic rainfall, dry lands have proven to be a vital part of the Earth's human and physical environment. About 40% of the world's land area falls under dry lands. These are further classified into arid, semi-arid, and dry subhumid. Dry lands are areas that are climatologically classified as either arid, semi-arid, or dry subhumid. This classification is based on the length of the growing season. For instance, the arid they range from 1 to 59 days in terms of growing season. The semi-arid regions, they range from uh, 60 to 119. And then the dry subhumid, they range from 120 to 179. In when agriculture is practiced in these dryland regions without the addition of irrigation, then we refer to it as dryland agriculture. Now, if this type of agriculture is well managed, it has the potential to produce enough food that is able to feed the whole nation. What is needed is to appreciate when to plant and when to harvest. So with the proper management, we are able to produce enough food. The dryland region is dotted by a very effective drainage network that results in having enough uh, water bodies in the river systems that are able to provide enough water for agriculture. The majority of these drylands occur in Africa and Asia. Zimbabwe has further refined the classification of its drylands into five agroecological zones. These regions have been used as a guide in determining the agricultural potential of the different parts of the country. So basically we have five ecological regions. Uh, we're blessed as Zimbabwe actually, uh, because we have everything really. And uh, so basically the semi-arid uh, arable uh, or semi-arid regions rather are region four and five. And because of climate, climatic changes, even regions one, two, and three are now, they're, they're getting affected now by, uh, you know, as you know, sometimes erratic rainfall, sometimes no rainfall whatsoever. So we have areas like even the West, which is a very good province, uh, where they will go, they, we've just been two seasons now without proper rainfall. And so basically, as ministry, we have to mitigate against that. Um, you know, it's not, it wasn't a secret that we have climate, climatic changes. The arid and semi-arid regions are also characterized by high variability in both rainfall amounts and intensities, as well as the occurrence of prolonged periods of drought. Generally, these dry rains are distributed across the, the globe. Um, areas that are 30 degrees uh, north and south of the equator are the areas that mainly experience or that have uh, these dry lands. Why? Because of uh, the atmospheric uh, uh, pressure systems. Uh, in, along the 30 degrees um, uh, south and uh, north of the equator, that's where we have a high pressure system which uh, results from uh, the Hadley cells. When the air is uh, descending in those areas, it, they create uh, pressure and normally rainfall is uh, formed when air is moving up. So in those areas, uh, air is descending, creating high pressure regions and uh, also creating dry conditions. The variability of the seasons has resulted in long dry spells and in extreme conditions such as prolonged drought and excessive flooding. 
we have been getting more frequent dry spells during the season not the traditional one that we are accustomed to usually that occurs uh, within the months either the end of December going into January or thereabouts when we have a transition usually in our rain for in, in our rain bearing systems but we have been getting them even in the months of December even in the months of uh, uh, of February even in the months of uh, March and this has had an effect usually when you look at our rain fed agriculture. In the geophysical realm, dry lands play a vital role in reflecting and absorbing solar radiation, a process that keeps the various atmospheric constituents at a balance. They are also known for their agricultural output, producing much of the world's grain and livestock. Drylands are rich ecosystems that provide a wide range of goods and services. Drylands provide a wide range of ecosystem goods and services. And these are the benefits that people derive from nature. And they can be categorized into provisional services, regulatory services, supporting services, and cultural services. When we talk of provisional services, we're talking of the firewood, the timber, we're talking of the food, the feed for the animals, and even talking of the medicinal benefits that we get also. When we talk of the uh, regulatory services, we're talking of wind breaks, we're talking of waste management, we're talking of water purification. Then when we talk of cultural value, we're talking of cultural identity. For instance, we know certain areas because of their ecosystem. Then lastly, when we talk of supporting services, we're talking of biodiversity conservation. Commonly known as the tree of life, the baobab is perfectly at home in the drylands. With its exceptional superfruit, this massive species of tree that can grow up to a height of 30 meters is the icon of the drylands. This tree must have such a significant um, both to the ecosystem and also to the communities. It absolutely does, yes. It has significance from a cultural level, a spiritual level, a utilization, and just being a symbol of our heritage, our African heritage as well. I work with communities um, just in the northern part of South Africa where there aren't elephants and lions anymore, but there are baobabs. And people come to see the baobabs. And it really is one of our cultural heritages in this area and in Africa. Other than it providing the most amazing fruit as well. So this fruit has got uh, a white, if you break it open, it's got a white powder in it. The other really amazing thing about this fruit is that it doesn't rot. So it's, it's ripe when it's dry. So if you think of an orange or an apple or something, the moment, because it's so full of moisture, an orange or an apple or banana can only last so long. You know, after about a week or a few weeks, they're not a, you can't eat them anymore. But baobabs can last for years because they've got no moisture in them. And still, yeah. they've got nutritional components, components that are incredibly valuable. So your vitamin C will go down over time because it oxidizes, but your calcium, magnesium, dietary fibers, which are so healthy for the body, for people, still maintain in the fruit. Dryland ecosystems also support a wide range of plants that have well-documented medicinal qualities. This plant is called Hudia lugardi, or Lugardi, and you can see it's a succulent. It's very well armed with spikes. They're very, very sharp. Um, there's evidence of a bit of browse going on. Um, they normally um, do quite well in these dry areas and they grow on rocky hillsides where the soil is quite um, shallow. And it's a protected species. Um, when in times of hunger, they would just slice it up and eat the flesh and it would just, um, you know, they wouldn't feel hunger. So pharmaceuticals hooked onto this plant as um, something that they could sell through um, natural food stores. They make capsules of it, they dry it, they grind it up, they make capsules or pills, and they sell it for a fortune. Within the drylands, one will not be surprised to encounter well-watered and lush patches of vegetation. These wet patches offer relief and are a source of life that rejuvenates and provides nutrition to animals and people alike. These semi-arid regions of Southern Africa are not a sea of dry land. Within the dry lands, we have got um, uh, wetlands, uh, areas which are relatively wetter than the surrounding areas. What is important is that these wetlands are the ones that do rejuvenate the dryland zones of uh, southern Africa. 
and with them they bring a wide variety of ecosystem services and products. And these wetlands have supported uh, people uh, in the recent past and also in the distant past. <laughs>
some food was also st stored in granaries which were built on top of um, um, platforms to ensure that the cereals um, are preserved. The adaptive use of drylands resulted in mixed economies characterized by crop cultivation, pastoralism, hunting, mining and trade. Mapela, Mapungupwe, Zimbabwe, Kami, Venda and Roswe are famed pre-colonial states that developed in southern Africa during the second millennium AD. Mapungubwe developed uh, on the con near the confluence of the Shashi and the Limpopo River. And the main advantage um, of being here is the water that comes from the larger catchment area uh, of southern Africa. Um, the, while this, this area may seem, seemingly look very dry and receives much less rainfall, probably 300 millimeters uh, per, per, per year, uh, the area receives moisture from the other regions, uh, from the bigger catchment area of the Limpopo and the Shashi, which brings a lot of water during the rain season. When the rain comes, when the rivers, these rivers flood, and much of the area you see on either side of the river floods, bringing moisture and also bringing uh, silt, which is very useful for crop cultivation. Dryland ecosystems play a major role as they provide much of the world's grain and livestock, forming the habitat that supports many vegetable species, fruit, trees and timber. An essential element in the success of communities living in drylands is the availability of water, a precious resource that often comes in the form of wetlands. We've got a permanent uh, water flow that exists within the region which is now used by farmers as an adaptation in developing their nutritive garden systems. These are the gardens which, where they grow nutritive relishes which are able to provide them with the, the right amount of nutrients that are needed. So in that aspect we are able to remove the aspect of silent hunger. Also in terms of water management they have come up with adaptive me mechanisms which are conservation strategies for instance, conservation tillage system, where they are now having minimum disturbance of the soil to make sure that no much amount of water is lost from the soil. By so doing, there is effective mulching, which enhances the amount of water that is available to the plants. A good agricultural season is well received and celebrated by the entire community, who partake in the various activities through work parties during planting, weeding, harvesting, processing and storage. Thereafter, a whole value addition chain follows in which the various crops are used in various domestic contexts. Uh, Sogam is one of our very important uh, traditional crops. Uh, it is used for a number of purposes in our culture. It is used for making the thick porridge, which is uh, sadza. We call it sadza in Shona. Uh, it is also used in the beverage industry. Uh, the processing part of this uh, important cereal has got some challenges. The first challenge is how to shell, uh, to remove the seed from the stock. Uh, at the moment, farmers, they use their hands to pound so that they can separate the seed from the stock. And this is a tedious and painful process. Uh, going forward, I think it is important for us to do some research and come up with technologies that can be used for shelling. The use of irrigation systems in dryland areas is another means of enhancing agricultural productivity on a large scale. Straddling the mighty Limpopo River in Baitbridge, Sentinel Farm is an apt example of the benefits of irrigation in dryland zones. What I've done here is I've planted 40 hectares of winter wheat 
Um, I've joined the command program in Zimbabwe, and we are growing uh, wheat for the country. Um, I'm in Bitebridge, I'm not in a very ideal area uh, for wheat, uh, because the high felts um, actually get higher yields. I'm expecting a yield of about, probably hoping, about five tons on a hectare. So we have planted this 40 hectares on a pivot, and it's very easy to grow. It's not a difficult crop at all. Uh, we irrigate um, completely. The whole crop is grown 100% on irrigation. We don't have any winter rainfall here. So we have to, it's expensive. We have to pump water out of the Limpopo River and pipe it to the field. And then we double pump again there to get the water into the pivot. So it's got quite high expenses to it. Um, electrical bills are quite high. But um, it does pay off if you get a good yield. Uh, I'm trying to get this five tons. Uh, it, uh, you know, we, we, we make something out of it. It's very good for the farm to be producing and um, the whole atmosphere of, of our staff and the people who live around us changes as harvest approaches. And there's this joy and this exuberance and everybody gets excited in the harvest um, and we all come out to the field and it, it just shows that that we can still produce in this country and um, and it's 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 just a wonderful feeling to be able to do that livestock production is also a mainstay in the economic activity in the arid and semi-arid zones some of the world acclaimed cattle breeds like the mashona nguni and the Thule have been successfully developed and improved in Zimbabwe's drylands. Livestock production systems in semi-arid areas of Zimbabwe is closely integrated with cropping enterprises. It is actually part of an integrated system of farming in communal areas. For example, we have inputs which come from livestock such as a draft power, fertilizers coming in the form of manure which we have here. Then from crops we also have crop residues which are an important source of feed for animals in semi-arid areas of Zimbabwe. So I am standing next to this euphorbia plant uh, which is a typical plant for the dryland uh, region. Uh, so in face value it just looks like a plant but also it's a very important uh, source of feed for livestock. As you can see here uh, a browse line is showing from this point uh, up to the to the ground level. Livestock they remove this uh, flesh uh, and it's a very important adaptation strategy for livestock. So drylands they've got a way of uh, keeping livestock it is a way of uh, making sure livestock survive. Goats and sheep also flourish in the dryland zones of southern Africa. Both indigenous and cross breeds of the small ruminants are well adapted to the seemingly harsh conditions of the semi arid regions. Coming to small stock, we've got the Sabi sheep. That's an indigenous breed which was first discovered in the early 50s along the Sabi River and it was brought to Matopos and that animal has survived up to, to date. And if you move around in the communal areas, you'll find that this breed of sheep is still there. Then with goats, we've got the indigenous goats in Zimbabwe, the Matebele, which is the Matopos, and then the Mashona goat. Unfortunately, I say Mashona hasn't been looked into seriously. But that's another breed which I think for these dry areas it could do very well without farmers putting a lot of input. An even more lucrative undertaking is wildlife ranging. This has been successfully adopted by several farmers in southern Africa's drylands. To me, uh, you know, being a wildlife farmer, uh, I live in a, 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 a very beautiful wildlife area with uh, uh, um, a lot of game around me. Uh, like elephants and warthogs and impala and animals like that and this is a very unnatural uh, growth of food that's within where these animals are so we try and coexist where I 
have put a very strong fence around this field and I've electrified it and uh, to prevent animals getting in here while I'm growing the crop. But once we've finished uh, combining and we've harvested, we open gates and we allow the animals in and we let them eat uh, the slava that's left over after the combining. Uh, historically, we are cattle farmers here, um, but we never really, you know, when you're actually looking at net profit off an area like this, uh, it's a very harsh area to try and make money out of. And, you know, in the 1980s, the safari wildlife industry uh, started uh, developing in Zimbabwe, and we then turned our attention more to wildlife and tourism. And it actually was a much kinder thing to do to this environment than trying to do cattle because there isn't much grass here and the wildlife is so much more adapted to the uh, vegetation here. It's very dry, very little grass in winter and we found that um, hunting and tourism actually made us uh, a lot more money than actually the cattle in the end. Nonetheless, agricultural productivity in the drylands continues to be a challenge, especially the increasing water scarcity emanating from a growing population and the corresponding demand for ecosystem services and goods. Wodori mai papo mwando sa tuwa inda wodzara wato zara zuzo zara wudi kumera iwa pesa wudi pose pa unoda uta pa waisa mafunde waisa nzungu waisa chii kuna yakuwe mvura kwa wano msiyan daga tarija kwa taka vana ko mvura edu yai na zwa unga kuna kurundi tira kuti iko zino yasuka pakat yasuka pakat. Zino iko zino. Zava sukungoti. Kana yanga ifana uti inae na November. Tawato nso unati. Ah, iya yanga 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 November yato amna chanyone. With increasing population overgrazing, clearance of land cover and climate change, the dryland zones are deteriorating and some areas are offering less and less ecosystem services. Drylands are a fragile ecosystem which were not properly managed cause serious land degradation. For example, here where I'm standing, it's a serious case of gully erosion, which could have emanated from quite a number of causes. Uh, causes can emanate from unplanned settlement, uh, indiscriminate cutting down of trees, and also uncontrolled livestock numbers, which now when flash floods come, they cause uh, this gully erosion that you see here. If we do not manage uh, well uh, the problems that I have highlighted, it's most likely uh, we have this problem on a broader landscape scale.